Yes, Greg J here. Coffee Conversations with Greg J is on. How are you today? Doing okay? okay? You know, doing all right, making it all happen. Check in with me here. Make sure that all systems are go. Getting some messages here, uh, you know, from Facebook. You know, he's over here just trying to have a great conversation, a great dialogue fostering peace and love and understanding in our communities. And, uh, you know, that's what it is. We, we're not, we don't mean no harm out here. <laughs> oh, Lord of mercy. Okay. COVID environment still going on. The good news is the numbers are going down, down, down. And, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing, but still... Uh, you know, wear your mask, I guess. Uh, they're relaxing the mask mandates uh, uh, every now and again. And um, but at the same time, shoot, you know, some people still have the mask mandates. I, I'm curious to know how they go ahead of the Super Bowl, Super Bowl week in Inglewood jumping off 70, 80, 90,000 people out there, you know trying to get into the Super Bowl. Hope everybody is wearing a mask. Hopefully people are vaccinated or whatever it is we need to do to stay safe out here. Excuse me for one moment while I look at my other monitor here, make sure everything, all systems are go. We got a great show today, you know, really excited about this uh, dialogue. We my when we began to um, promote this show this morning, Coffee Conversations with Greg J, uh, we got a lot of uh, different, you know, inbox messages and responses and all that. You know, folks been talking about this subject for a, a week now, and we just decided we wanted to just have. Uh... Oh wow. Ah, all right. Look, here's the thing. If you all are trying to see Coffee Conversations with Greg J on Facebook Live, it seems that someone has tried to hack me. Uh, this says that my account has been locked. They saw unusual activity on my account. And this may mean that someone has used your account without my knowledge. Okay. Now, let me just speak on that for a minute. We speak from a global Black perspective on a number of issues. We do not preach hate. We seek understanding and peace. Uh, yes, Rabbi, I can see you. I can see you in there. <laughs> You know, and um, let me just tell y'all a story before we get into it, because we can still record this, and then we'll just put it out there live, and we're going to be audio. You know, y'all can't stop us. We got we can repurpose the audio wherever you hear the podcast. You get your favorite podcast. You can get, you know, Coffee Conversations with Greg J. And, uh, you know, we come from a, a decidedly uh, African-American perspective, a global diasporic perspective because we want to examine you know our history we want to examine our issues we want to talk about this stuff this is what we do and if you know greg J, this is what i've been doing for more than 30 years so you know so the other day this is funny a lot of you will appreciate this so there's this one of i'm you know somewhat of a foodie and uh you know i'm on this group uh, called the Long Beach food scene, you know. And somebody got on there and they wanted to get, you know, waffles. And so uh, one person got on there and totally eviscerated Roscoe's chicken and waffles. And the subject, the epicenter of the discussion was this person wanted their waffles hard, Belgian style. They call it liege style. Well, you know, Roscoe's, they try to be in Belgium. They're from South L.A. But we get our waffles soft, our biscuits fluffy. 
we got collard greens and grits at Roscoe's. But if you go to other establishments, you know, they, they have their liege waffles, but you're not going to get collard greens and chicken and all this whole thing, you know. It's cultural, you know. Do you know somebody tried to hack me? Because I went and I explained the origin of Roscoe's. And immediately when I made the post, I was talking about Roscoe's was centered in the African-American tradition of soul food. And this is what how we get down, right? And immediately somebody tried to hack me. So now, here we are. We, we the, con the conversation today, I guess you could call it controversial. Well, no, I'm going to go ahead and call it that because when we began to post this, I mean, I got a lot of inboxes and emails. People have been talking about this for a week. And, uh, you know, I, it's the, this premise that we put out there that we wanted to talk about this morning, um, you know, ignited a lot of emotion. It's deep, you know. But here at Coffee Conversations with Greg J, we're always seeking understanding and we always operate from a space of love. And, you know, I'm out there making new friends. These aren't my opinions. These are, I'm going out, I'm bringing you academics, ministers, like theologians, you know, professors, you know, we just analyzing the subjects at hand that are before us. And so today we're doing the same thing. This is the thing. So about a week or so ago, we had heard the news, you know, Whoopi Goldberg on The View made some remarks about the Holocaust and saying basically that the Holocaust was not about racism, but it was about man's inhumanity against man. Long story short, some people felt that this was anti-Semitic. The bosses at ABC suspended her, and it's a big deal, right? And there's a lot of, I was looking this morning and preparing for this morning's talk. I didn't realize there were so many op-eds, New York Times, Washington Post. It's like everybody's got something to say, right? Dude, some in support of Whoopi Goldberg, others, your man Mel Gibson called her a Jew hater. I was like, dang, you know. So, you know, I just wanted to gain understanding. And, you know, this is how we do it. You guys know this is what we do. We grab our coffee, get our friends. Some are new friends. Some are old friends. We get our friends and we just sit here and we chop it up. It's not meant to point the finger. We want to we wanna get past the, the tenor of rabble rousing and get into like, okay, well, let's just talk. Let's talk. Let's, you know, shoot. It's about peace and love. So we're just going to sit here and talk about it. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, got, you know, friends in high places. Renee Simon used to be the city council person in the 70s in Long Beach, California. She is of the Jewish faith. And I was like, Renee, who can I talk to about this issue? And so she turns me on to her pastor. I think that's the, the uh, proper designation. I'm always going to come from the African-American Pentecostal church tradition. So if I step on some toes, excuse me. <laughs> but, you know, I had a really good talk with this gentleman yesterday, and this is my new friend, good guy, Rabbi Scott Fox of the Temple Israel, Long Beach, California. How are you, sir? I'm doing really well. And Greg, I, I had a wonderful conversation with you yesterday uh, as well. And, you know, I think sometimes there are things that end up on the news or, or in, in conversations, uh, you know, that, that there's a snippet that makes its way to YouTube and Facebook and all over. And, um, and it's important for us to talk about, you know, kind of how, uh, how different, different issues get kind of played out in the media and such. But I think that so often, there's no way to understand it from that two second soundbite. And so I'm really excited to have an opportunity uh, to talk through things together and maybe get a little bit closer to understanding uh, the, the bigger picture. Greg, I, I really had a, a, a real joy. Uh, it was really a pleasure to, to talk yesterday and just kind of connect. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to both kind of expanding and getting a better understanding for, for me anyway of, of this particular subject um, and I certainly have my thoughts, but also 
you know, I think some things only become clear from an hour long conversation where if somebody were to ask you about a sentence up for that conversation later, you'd say, well, I can't really do that, but it was a good conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And to have the opportunity for the two of us to, to connect, to get to know you a little bit better as well, Greg. So thank you very much for You for got a deal, Rabbi. Look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm looking, this is a young man. I'm ex I was expecting oh, a guy with the big beard. And the <laughs> I will take that as long as I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's what's up. That's what's up. Well, you know, Rabbi, first of all, before we get into it, you know, COVID environment, I ask everybody that comes through, man, you know, how are you doing? How's your family? And then you're a shepherd of a flock. How's the congregation? So if I don't answer all those different pieces, r remind me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm doing well. Um, we, um, we've we been, you know, very, very cautious. We have very um, particular, uh, you know, practices in the congregation. Uh, you know, when, when this kind of came up, I said, uh, this is great. And, and the congregation had actually already started to navigate this before I joined the community. I, I've been here for just over a year and a half. Um, but when the conversation, the questions come up, I say, I'm not an expert in public health. Uh, and thankfully, we have a number of members of our community who are. And so we bring them together and we have conversations about what are the right and safe ways of, of keeping our community safe. Um, and, uh, and so we've, we've had those practices and we've, we've been very fortunate that, um, that, uh, that, that the members of our community have, have stayed quite safe throughout the pandemic, uh, for, for us, um, we're, uh, we're, we're safe as well. Uh, you know, we're, our family, we're all, uh, you know, vaccinated and, and, uh, are also, you know, remaining masked and such. Um, but the big thing for us is we have a little two and a half year old that, uh, that we've tried to kind of keep, you know, make sure uh isn't isn't exposed uh from too many places but uh mm -hmm. we're we're you know given given the pandemic uh it's just a, another reminder that uh that the beach is an open and outdoor space uh that uh that is is safe as long as we're distanced and so just have to spend a little more time at the beach that's at all. the beach that's right that's right good stuff good stuff all right well let's get right down to it you know whoopi goldberg says what she says on the air Folks are upset, a variety of opinions. You know, I'd like to just start and ask, all right, so she says the Holocaust wasn't about racism, but it's about man's inhumanity to man. Is she right? And then what is, or what is your sense of that statement? Is that an anti-Semitic statement? So I have to say that I can absolutely see where she's coming from. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the philosophers in the Jewish world, who himself is a whole, uh, was a Holocaust survivor, um, spent a lot of time writing about what happened. What happened in the Holocaust? How how did such a terrible uh, catastrophe, you know, spiral into existence uh, in 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 this world? And he spent a lot of time writing um, and came to uh, the conclusion for him that. What happened during the Holocaust was human beings stopped seeing each other as human beings. And so I can absolutely see where uh, Whoopi Goldberg would be coming from with this question of that it is absolutely a situation where two human beings or, or, or many, many human beings, literally millions of human beings, uh, stopped seeing the humanity in one another. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, in many ways, the, the term racism uh, is, is, is so often couched in the situation of the Holocaust. Um, and it is a fundamentally, uh, racist, it was a fundamentally racist enterprise in the, in the idea that they wanted to exterminate what the Germans, or, or I shouldn't say the Germans, but the Nazis saw as the Jewish race. Now here's the issue. And it's interesting, Greg, I was thinking about this because you and I talked a little bit about critical race theory yesterday. Mm -hmm. And this ties into critical race theory that the, the idea of racism is fundamentally flawed. Mm -hmm. Not just that it doesn't work, not just that it's not true, but the, it's fundamentally flawed in the idea that you would have different groups, different, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that you would have different groups, different races uh, is fundamentally flawed. Uh, and we know that just through biology. We know that through uh, through 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 science. And, um, you know, I always think about white supremacy. 
is this idea, this conspiracy, that Jews are controlling all of the various quote unquote non-white groups uh, to take over the world. Right. That's that that is the that is the the the, the idea of white supremacy. Just mm -hmm. right. We we heard, you know, the Jews will not replace us. That's what that whole Jews will not replace us thing was. Um, and so it can be puzzling of well, why why are Jews being singled out as opposed to any other group that that you know that white supremacists might be singling out? And I I think that it ties into this issue, uh, this this fundamental issue of of the, the problematic nature of racism, and Jews are a per, they are they are the, the I think the best example of that. So for the Nazis to walk up and say we are going to uh, exterminate and annihilate every Jew, their biggest problem is figuring out who is a Jew. <laughs> they had a whole set of categories of trying to figure out. Well, okay, if if one grandparent is Jewish, and I know this is not foreign to the black community as well. Uh, that if one grandparent is Jewish, then then they're Jewish, right? But I can tell you that I've sat in this room, I'm in my office right now, with people who uh, at two o'clock were not Jewish and at three o'clock were Jewish. You can convert into Judaism. And so the fact that it's supposed to have this hard line between who is Jewish and who is not, but you can go in and out, it blows up the whole idea of the categories themselves. And so um, the, the, so I know you were asking about Whoopi Goldberg, but, but I would catch it in that um, I think where she may be coming from is saying racism is flawed and racism, or, or I will say that I am saying that racism is flawed, but I think that her, her comments are couched in the idea that this is really about human beings, not seeing each other as human beings. The issue uh, is that racism is a term that is used today to identify um, uh, the discrimination of different groups, and and the Holocaust is is a, is is one of many examples of that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of the comments that I got, especially from uh, one of my friends who's out in Nairobi, Kenya, and this talks about there's only one race, the human race, right? And so um, we, you know, where we are really. He even called it apples to oranges because uh, what we're talking about are belief systems, not races, right? And it was this, it was kind of uh, very interesting and actually uh, kind of interweaves itself into what you were just saying. So where people can, um, they can uh, 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 convert, I guess, into Judaism and. Um, there is this underlying piece of, you know, the white supremacists, uh, they hate everybody. It's like, the okay, so the Jews, the Blacks, Latinos, Indians, just on and on and on. They're trying to be the only folks in the whole world. I, this is what I see. Uh, that's confusion even in and of itself. But let me ask you this. So just to be clear, so the question, one of the questions that came out, just I guess this is more, it's kind of a sociological question in, indeed. And so, so you're saying Jew, being Jewish, Jewish I threw out a lot there, Craig. Jews, I want to own a Jews are question. not a race, right? right? <laughs> or are they a race? Are Jews a race? Are you, as a Jewish person, is that your race or what's it? What is it? So that's that's a question that is asked in the Jewish community, right? Because uh, we are identified from without sometimes, for example, during Nazi Germany as a race. But I can assure you that Jews are of all colors from all around the world of all different uh, all different kind of uh, you know hereditary her you know heritages or 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 uh, or, or different genetic makeups um, and. Uh, that it, it, it makes that question of race a very difficult question. I think most Jews would say that uh, to be Jewish is, is a religion and not a race. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but the, the, the notion uh, from without of the Jewish community and certainly uh, from a lot of, a lot of uh, hate groups is, uh, is, is to try and define uh, different groups and Jews are often categorized as a race by those mm -hmm. groups. Uh, and so we sometimes find ourselves as being identified as a race when we ourselves are saying, well, we're really a community, a faith community. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's difficult to say that we're a race when when 
you can the, the lines are are so porous and 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 we come from all over and there's even different traditions within within Judaism and so um, I, I again think that um, it's very difficult to call the Jewish community a race and the biggest reason for that is it's very difficult to define what race is in the first place um, mm -hmm. but at the very least um, it's too porous uh, so we do not identify most of us uh, mm -hmm. don't identify ourselves as a race. Now you said that when you you know observed Whoopi Goldberg's statement, you could understand where she's coming from, and so in your world, uh, I'm sure you've come across people who were like, "Oh, she's a racist. She's anti-Semitic. Ah, boo!" You know, talk a little bit about that. What? How? Why do? Okay, for me, I'm just going to ask you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. It's it's interesting. It was it was a little bit different the response that that we got. So go go ahead. Okay, I. Or that I got. I'm trying a, to figure possibly. out what does she do wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the response in our community uh, was largely, "Rabbi, are we a race?" <laughs> um, and uh, and you know, first of all, one of the things I love about being a rabbi is I, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, but we are all together. Uh, identifying and understanding what Judaism is. So mm -hmm. I am, I, I'm, I'm happy to help share, but we we're answering that question collectively, mm -hmm. but I think that we would probably, the, the majority of us say, we're not a race. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so exactly that, it would be puzzling to say, well, isn't that what Whoopi Goldberg was, was saying was that it's not a racial issue. It's, it's an mm -hmm. issue of, of humanity. And that's again, why I don't think that there was certainly there was, wasn't any ill, Ill will. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I don't get the feeling that Whoopi Goldberg has a, has a poor even understanding of mm -hmm. the issues, uh, of the Holocaust and of racism. Um, but the issue was, and, and it was a little bit strange that she, she seemed to insist on it not being, uh, an issue of racism when, uh, when that term, uh, almost categorically, uh, um, includes, uh, includes, uh, genocide. Uh, mm -hmm. and includes circumstances like the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the biggest problem is the way that it, uh, the, it you know, I, I could see having a conversation, uh, a, not unlike the conversation we're having here, but that's not set on media, that's mm -hmm. not set on a, a place where it's broadcast uh, out more widely, where there are people who are participating in the conversation, but don't have a, a microphone, mm -hmm. um, that it, it, it changes the way that we think we say things. Uh, it changes the way that we, uh, the, the things that we say are, are understood. And so, uh, you know, to have a conversation of saying, uh, you know, well, is the Holocaust a, a circumstance of people not recognizing each other as, as human beings? I don't think anyone would say no, mm -hmm. but the fact that, um, that, uh, that the takeaway or one of the takeaways from that conversation was to hear Whoopi Goldberg say uh, that the Holocaust was not a racist event um, is, is, is just puzzling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so it requires conversation like, like conversation we're having, like we're having today. today. Sure. So, sure. So, so for mm -hmm. us, uh, give it to me, you know, what, you know, maybe some folks, they, we only hear the surface of the term, the Holocaust, but, just uh, re-educate some of us. What is or what was the Holocaust? Sure, sure. So um, anti-Semitism, like many different uh, types of hate, has been around for for millennia, for centuries and millennia. Hmm. Um, but the Holocaust, in particular, was the circumstance of the the Nazi Party coming to power in Germany um, at a time when Germany was uh, very much in. Uh, in kind of economic shambles. And you had this charismatic leader who came up and started spouting all kinds of lies that, um, that, uh, that caught onto the, the community. And um, not, not to harp on media, but uh, it's an important piece to note that media was a critical part of this, that he found some new way uh, there was a new media that was coming out, television and and uh, and 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 the the power of the radio, and he found a way to utilize that to uh, to to push his message. Um, and people didn't quite understand the impact. So I, I will I will mention much in the way that we see a lot of things kind of fly around on social media, and the the question of oh well you have to 
check whether it's true or not. Mm-hmm. It was a similar thing in Nazi Germany. They would just literally make videos and movies. And it was so powerful to have a new media um, sharing that message that they, they really just took it at its, at its word or, or, or on its face value. They didn't, they didn't question much of it. Um, and uh, the message was a fundamentally racist message. The idea that there was, um, you know, the, it, was, it was white supremacy uh, exactly in its form, that there was some form of whiteness that, um, that, that was separate from other groups and that that, that form was, uh, was better. Uh, and so to make the world better, they would cleanse the world of all the other groups. And they identified Jews as the kind of target of that. Um, again, with this, this conspiracy that Jews were controlling all the other groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the Holocaust, um, that, that's, the, that's how the Holocaust came about. But um, the, the Holocaust itself was a systematic extermination of millions of people. Um, and six million of those people uh, were Jewish, and they would literally um, um, put them into uh, train cars uh, and cart them out to extermination camps where they would kill them uh, uh, again in the millions. It, it, it's, it's a little hard to think about what uh, that number uh, looks like, given that millions is, is such a, such a it, it, it's an unbelievable number to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, given the magnitude of the, the, the murder uh, that happened, and I need to say that Jews were absolutely not the only group, um, but they were the targeted group uh, during the Holocaust, um, that, um, that we are still today uh, not just mourning, but unpacking uh, mm-hmm. this, uh, this great catastrophe in, uh, in history. So, you know, here's a similarity to communities, right? So we could talk about the, you know, the transatlantic slave trade or what we call the African slave trade. We could talk about Jim Crow laws and lynching. And I'm a child of the civil rights movement. And I remember coming up and, you know, you could see your aunties and uncles and your grandma and them could remember, you know, the horrors of Jim Crow and lynching. And I guess in the Jewish community, you, you know, your aunties and grannies and everybody, they were there, right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a tremendous burden to bear, isn't it? Well, so, you know, in, in the Jewish community, we have this, this rich, rich history of Eastern European Judaism. There's Judaism mm-hmm. all over the world, but millions and millions. Uh, and then you roll right up to the 1930s, and then it just disappears. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it is uh, very common, uh, just about... Uh, I would be shocked if less than two thirds of the the Jewish community, at least in Long Beach, uh, didn't have a relative that was that was killed in the Holocaust. And it is a burden that we bear. Um, and I, I think um, that there's a little bit of a shift for us, though, in that it it happened uh, in another place. And mm-hmm. the, the history of the United States and the Jewish community in the United States absolutely is deeply tied to that. But it's 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 a it's a trauma absolutely, and it's one that we have been unpacking literally for generations. But I, I wonder whether it is quite as present for us as it is in the Black community. I I, I can't imagine not only hearing these stories, but I, I myself have gone to uh, um, uh, some of these extermination camps, and it's it, it's more than shocking. I'm I'm frozen, and I'm 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 uh, I'm devastated. But Greg, to be in the United States where you're not talking about something that happened on the other side of an ocean, you're pointing into uh, a place, you know, a mile from from the house that you're sitting in. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't imagine the the, the burden uh, of carrying that 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 trauma. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty deep, and you know, we uh, uh, were just in Ghana uh, for two and a half weeks of in December. And uh, while I have gone to South Africa many, many times, this is my first visit to West Africa. And part of that experience was to go through the slave dungeons, right? And just to really see the magnitude of the financial institution of slavery and walking through the dungeons, right? And I think uh, what you're describing when you went to the camps is, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, it's very similar to what we were feeling as we walked through the dungeons. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's emotional, you know. It's it's real deep, you know, to uh, to see, you know, the 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 result, the the mechanism 
of white supremacy of man's inhumanity to man uh to take Whoopi Goldberg's words it was just really 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 something now you know let me just ask this question of you all right so the eastern european you know tradition is it you're saying that it literally was uh, obliterated is it because of how the nazi party operated in those days and times yeah sorry <laughs> something yeah, yeah. that there was a uh... Um, the, it was, yeah, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. I remember talking to a, a friend a handful of years ago and, um, he was talking about his partner, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I knew that his partner had passed away, but he, he kind of shared, you know, uh, that his partner died of, of AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and he kind of turned to me and he said, you know, you have to understand we, we have a whole generation that was lost. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very similar in, in the Jewish, uh, community. And, and that's not to say that there, there's a, a very large and vibrant gay Jewish community as well, but, um, that there's a whole generation that was just lost the, the um, yesterday I showed a, a cartoon from the, from the, the Yiddish daily forward, which was one of the largest newspapers in the United States. Um, and it was, um, it, it, um, it was written in Yiddish. Now there's a different history to, to why that's not used as much today, but there was a, a rich history of, of, uh, of, of, of Yiddish, uh, culture and, and literature um, and uh, Eastern European culture out in, in Eastern Europe um, that was, that just disappeared. Uh, and it needs to be said that not everybody um, died in the Holocaust, that there were a number of people who came to the United States. Um, there were a number of people who uh, moved to what became the, the, the Soviet Union. Um, but Jews in the millions, we, we lost uh, a whole generation. Um, and I also need to say that I didn't mean to uh, diminish the, the impact of the Holocaust within our community as well. The, the trauma that's passed down from Holocaust survivors to the generations after. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so is there a post, you know, we have uh, post, what do they call it? Post-slave syndrome, you know, has been written about by a lot of um, a lot of academics and intellectuals, several books out there. Is there a same in the Jewish community? Post-Holocaust syndrome? Interesting. Uh, you know, I think that we wouldn't shy away from many of us describing uh, post-traumatic, uh, you know, PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think for us, it's very much a, a project of not forgetting, of remembering. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, mm -hmm. I just happened to be the, the chair of the committee uh, this year uh, that is a, a, a committee that is organizing the entire Jewish community around uh, a, a Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah. Mm -hmm. in, in Hebrew, uh, the Holocaust is known as the Shoah. Uh, and um, uh, and we're going to have a whole service. You know, the, the Jewish community uh, is, is not divided. Um, we do a lot of things together, but we, we have our own kind of different communities. But when, when, we, when we start remembering the Holocaust, we're, um, we're, we come together immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a very important and strong piece of what it means to be Jewish, and for a lot of us, it's uh, recognizing and dealing with that that stress, uh, mm -hmm. that that um, that post traumatic or or I hadn't thought of it before, um, and I, I love the way that you describe it, Greg. Of you know uh, post uh, post Holocaust syndrome, um, uh, and I think for us also, there's a, a a lot of conversation about not forgetting and looking around and seeing how this is happening today. Mm -hmm. um, a handful of years ago, uh, Harold Schulweis, who is a rabbi, who was a rabbi up in the valley, um, stood in front of his congregation and said, we have been saying, don't forget. But we're standing here while atrocities are being uh, committed in Darfur. Mm -hmm. And um, and it sparked a whole movement across the United States, uh, uh, literally the Save Darfur movement to to um, to work to uh, to. Uh, to help 
those who are experiencing genocide and violence today. And so in the Jewish community, um, and, and it spans in, in a myriad of different ways. Um, I, I can tell you that um, uh, a lot of the, a, a lot of the, the marching uh, as a part of uh, the, um, the, the demonstrations uh, in the past year with the Black Lives Matter movement, there were a lot of Jewish people who were involved and, uh, and many people said, we've been here. We're, we, we don't forget. And we are, we are a part of, uh, of making this world a better place today as well. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You said that, uh, uh, you know, the Jewish community is everywhere, you know, all colors and everything. And I will share with you, I did say, and this is, I'm speaking to your never forget, um, comment okay so uh, i was bused to school i come up in the in this in the child of the civil rights movement and when they began to uh in san diego okay we were talking about that yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're we're homeboys <laughs> right yeah. so uh, you know we i come up in the time where okay they wanted to integrate the school so we get go to bus over to East San Diego and there's the Jewish community center there. And, you know, there's a lot of Jewish people at the school, you know, and I got to tell you, a lot of them had Afros back in those yep. days. We, you know? So you should know that we, we call them uh, Jewfros. Ah, see, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny, so funny, you know, and then, uh, you know, and as you made friends, right, you become, I, I became aware that their parents were teaching them never forget, never forget. And I was having this discussion with my mom and, and I'm, I'm, I have to just kind of put a pin in it and tell you all that I am conscious at the level that I am because of my mother. My mother, in we, I said, a child of the civil rights movement, my mother ingrained this into me, right? And so when I would share with her what my, my new Jewish friends were talking about, hey, mom said, never forget, never forget. And she said, yes, you too, never forget. And so that has always been written on my heart to never forget our struggle here in America. And uh, yeah, definitely, um, uh, understanding that the Jewish community comes from all over the world. Now, uh, just asking you a tough question here. There are people in the community who would say that the Jewish, there are some Jewish people who ha have engaged in white supremacy. So let's talk about ah. South Africa. Okay, so South Africa, yeah. then when we look at in Israel, the Jews against the Palestinians, People see that and they articulate that as Jews being racist or participating in white supremacy. What do you say about that? I know you've heard it before, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the, the situation in Israel is, is very complicated and it, it really would merit its own conversation um, because it's, uh, it, it's, um, uh, well, it's, it's just a very complicated situation within the, the situation of Israelis and Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the issue of, of racism is hard to, to talk about in, in many ways uh, in that situation because Israel itself is kind of grappling with, well, what, what does it mean to, to have people as part of, of Israel? Um, there is no question that the Palestinians have done things that are uh, unforgivable, and there is no question that the Israelis have done things that are unforgivable. And uh, so, I, I really feel like to 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 do justice to that particular conversation, we would need we would need a whole nother hour. That's another um, show. All I, right. I need to say, but I but I do not want to miss the opportunity, yeah. um, or or have not said that there is no question in my mind uh, that in in um, in instances around the world that Jews have participated in, uh, and I think. I, I think often unknowingly or unwittingly because white supremacy itself uh, excludes Jews from that, that hierarchy, uh, but have, have um, been complicit uh, in, in, uh, in, in the project of, of, of white supremacy and in that conspiracy, or at least the, the, uh, the project of fighting against that conspiracy. Um, uh, no question, no question about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, and mm -hmm. part of the, part of the issue, and it's interesting, you know, um, Whoopi Goldberg kind of noted this also, uh, and she she said, you know, if if I'm walking down the street and there's someone from the clan walking towards me and a friend, 
who happens to be Jewish. Now, she didn't mention Jewish and white. There are many black Jews and there are many Jews, as I said, of, of various different, uh, you know, uh, we look all different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but if uh, if she was walking down the street next to a, a, a white Jewish person, uh, she would kind of run away um, because she's very identifiable. Right. Mm -hmm. You walk into a room as a as a black person and you are you are identified as a black person for me. Unless I'm wearing a kippah, um, there's no way to identify me as a Jew. And so uh, Jews have, uh, have, have found a fluidity that, by the way, we've never had in history, um, that, uh, that <clears throat> we, we might be recognized or included uh, in, in the white group. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, as soon as Judaism comes out, then it's, ah, okay, that's different. Um, mm. but I could very easily, uh, and I'm sure that I've, I've met, you know, lots of people who have not met me in my capacity as a rabbi, have not seen me wearing a kippah, that I'm just walking through the grocery store and buying something that don't identify me as a Jew. Whereas I imagine Greg for yourself, that, that, that is something that, that is identified, uh, all the time. You know, there's, there's even, uh, there's some, there's a couple of great movies that identify this, not, not to talk too, too long on this, but, um, there's a movie um, uh, I'm going to forget the name, but, um, sorry to bother you. I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw this movie, uh, where there's a, a, a telemarketer who is played by a black actor. Um, but anytime he's on the phone talking to someone, uh, the actor that does the voice is a white actor. And it mm -hmm. kind of identifies this, this kind of divide of, well, what are the identifying pieces of, of, uh, of the, the parts of our identity? Um, and, uh, and ironically enough, the, the actor who is playing the white actor is actually, a, he's actually Jewish, but that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of in and of itself. But there's also, um, Spike Lee did uh, black Klansman not too mm -hmm. long ago, mm -hmm. which I thought was brilliant, mm -hmm. right? He took a, a real story of a, a white person who kind of infiltrated, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and, um, uh, you know, who was kind of an undercover, uh, for, for, for the police and, uh, and made his way into the Ku Klux Klan saying he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, even though he didn't actually believe the things that they did. Now, mm -hmm. in, in, in actuality, in reality, the person was not Jewish, but Spike Lee did something I thought was genius. He made this character Jewish. So this character was passing as a white supremacist, even though they themselves were Jewish. Uh, mm -hmm. Further kind of clarifying that, that, that blurred line between uh, what does it mean to be Jewish versus white? There's uh, there's there's not a lot of uh, clarity in that. Uh, and so mm -hmm. to answer your question, um, there have been unquestionably Jews who have slipped into uh, that that uh, that project of hate. Um, although uh, we are uh, not unclear in any way in our Jewish mm -hmm. community that that we stand categorically uh, against hate, and we we are deeply involved in the project of, of working against it. You know, it's a very interesting. Uh, I, I mentioned early on in the show that a lot of people had been texting and calling when they found out that you were going to be on. And uh, one of my friends called it. They were very, um, I guess I want to say emotional, but the the conversation was intense. And it's like, why are you even going down this road? And he's oh, just, sure. the one thing is this. They can hide. They they won't know exactly what you just said. You know, right. they won't know. You can't hide your color. You know, so they're going to come after you first. You know, and it was an interesting discussion. I was like, yeah, well, true, but I just think it, the subject matter deserves uh, coming to the coffee table and 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 dialoguing, right, and just trying to have a, a understanding because we're all here together. And that's the, the real thing. And if we're promoting peace and love, we got to come together and, and have a chat about it. Now, you know, let me ask you this. All right. So I know that it is considered to be anti-Semitic to say when they say, OK, well, the Jews run the music business. OK, that's the that's the I'm in that business. I'm going to tell you. So sure, my sure. Jewish friends would get upset when you say that. But Rabbi, when I look at who's running the record companies, <laughs> So, so I, I have to tell you, there, there's a couple different ways to, that, that I have to answer this, but I have to start with a joke because I'm, I'm Jewish, right? So um, the joke is that when John Oliver interviewed the Israeli ambassador to the UN, um, he asked him you know, these hard pressing questions and he said, is it true? He's a comedian. He said, is it true that in Israel, the Jews run the government? 
<laughs> this is brilliant, right? So, um, but in in the United States, there is there are a lot of Jews in uh, in media, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. One is that we have a long history of being literate. In fact, one of the reasons, one of the theories about why Jews have been targeted in addition to other groups, or or uh, historically, uh, so much is that Jews um, became uh, in the Middle Ages a middle class between the the, um, the the royalty or the ruling class and the the working class because we were literate and numerate, and so we could essentially uh, we could do the the um, the the booking and and the the accounting and all those different pieces because we 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 had the the ability to use that you know the, those 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 faculties so. Um, uh, so it was only a small extension for Jews to come to the United States and start writing. Uh, you know, you look at the list of, of Nobel laureates for literature and you'll find a bunch of Jews there. You find, um, you know, music, uh, you'll find a bunch of Jews. Now Jews make up 2% of the population in the United States, but we were all over the media. And, and I think one of the things is that we have we have an intellectual culture. Mm -hmm. um, you turn 13 in, in our Jewish community and we don't take you out and ask you to chop wood or, uh, or, or teach you how to fix a car or whatever it might be. We sit down with our kids and we say, we want you to learn a foreign language. We want you to study and we want you to teach us. And I, there are 13 year olds stand in front of the community and lead in a foreign language, a whole service that they have been practicing. And then they teach us, they interpret the words of the Torah and they tell us what they mean. So that sets an entire culture of intellectuals. Um, and so we have gone into uh, fields that, that kind of fit that because it's part of our culture. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the film industry in particular, um, there, is, there is a historical reason for that. Um, you had Jews uh, who uh, were fleeing Eastern Europe, and by the way, not not the Holocaust. They were fleeing pogroms, state-sanctioned uh, riots that that would go through and and uh, and attack Jews. Um, and they came to the United States uh, around the turn of the century. Over a million Jews um, before they kind of closed the border, uh, right around the time of the Chinese immigration, which is a whole conversation in and of itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, of why they kept it open for the Jews. There was plenty of discrimination, but why they kept it open for the Jews, the Irish, some of the, the groups that might be more identified as white and then closed it for the Chinese. Um, uh, but, um, but Jews came to New York and they were going to the golden Medina, the, the golden land. They, they wanted to be in a place that was, uh, that was, um, you know, they, they, they were, the, 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 the story was that people were writing from New York to people in Eastern Europe, uh, mm -hmm. and saying, and again, I need to say not all Jews live in Eastern Europe, but there was a large group that happened to have moved to the United States. So it's a large segment of, of the American Jewish community, but they were writing saying that the streets here are lined with gold and they're, they don't discriminate against you as a Jew. And the discrimination was not quite state sanctioned in the same way, but there was still plenty of discrimination mm -hmm. and cities at that time were not the most pleasant places to live. And so you had Jews in New York saying, there's got to be more than this. If I picked up my whole life and moved across the world, why wouldn't I just keep trying this? Mm -hmm. And so they kept moving all the way out until they came to California. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'd like to say that they, you know, they saw the beach and, uh, and, and were here, you know, in, in February in the beautiful weather and said, I think we'll stay here. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, the medium of film was just starting to be established mm -hmm. and they started dreaming. If they were going to recreate their world out here on the West Coast, they were also going to do it through media. And so you had all of these filmmakers, not the people on the screen, but the people behind the screen, because Jews were not supposed to be on the screen. Uh, it was still very much a white, uh, you know, a, a white medium in terms of visually. Um, and I'm sure you and I both are, are well familiar with the racist uh, history of, of film as well. Mm -hmm. um, but these industries were they were creating a dream because they were they were trying to leave behind this terrible history. And so Jews came to uh, the West uh, and uh, are, are a large part of the uh, of the building of the film industry because of that. 
Um, so I think it would probably be both of those things. We have an intellectual culture uh, and we were a big part of, of establishing the film industry, but um, it also needs to be said that, that not all, you know, musicians, that it's not a huge group. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know I'm talking quite a bit, but I'll, I'll mention that I, I worked at Cornell for a little bit and we used to have this board uh, up uh, outside of our hello offices. And we would ask a question, you know, what's your favorite Jewish food, whatever. And there was one that's, that said, what's your favorite Jewish musician? And I went, ah, well, all right, I'm working with, you know, te you know, uh, teenagers and college students. I'm going to find some hip something. So like half the, half the students wrote Drake, right? Cause he's Jewish and he's a rapper. Um, and then I was like, okay, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to write slash the guitar player from, from, uh, from guns and roses. And so I went on and I found out he's not Jewish. I was like, all right, all right, I'm going to look for some other Jewish musicians. And there are, right? David Lee Roth, and we've all heard the Adam Sandler song, right? But I was like, all right, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I think I heard once that Ringo was Jewish. Why don't, I, why, don't I, why don't I put Ringo up there? Not Jewish either. I actually had trouble finding uh, a Jewish musician to put up on, on the board. Um, um, part of it was because I think we, we see a lot of Jews in, in the musical industry, but uh, it, 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 it may be more that, that we've identified uh, the Jews. They're, they're not, you know. All right. It's, yeah. it's not quite uh, as big, I think, as, as sometimes we might think. Pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty, pretty interesting. All right. So, look, let's change lanes a little bit. I want to have a... Uh, uh, um, I want to have a little fun here, I, but I'm just trying to ask some questions now. You know, I would have come. These questions are coming from, you know, the Black Church experience, and uh, within the Black Church experience, mine is always from the Pentecostal tradition. And uh, so, like, okay, Rabbi, you you're in there, you're preaching your sermon. Now, do y'all sing your sermons? Is that what I'm saying? This is how I how do I understand it? Do you sing your sermon or what? what do or, I sing it? No, no, we um we in the Jewish tradition we have a lot more uh, of our service that is singing and prayers and, and such. Um, the sermons are much shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, and so, no, I'll, 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 I'll share them. I'll speak them uh, and hopefully uh, teach something that's interesting uh, with, with the community, share something mm -hmm. uh, that I might find in the, in the Torah or something going on uh, in our world. Mm -hmm. I saw uh, that you're having a, a, a Torah study, coming up where uh, she's going to teach about Moses and his stuttering and, and whatnot. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And I wanted to ask you, do you know the story of Moses? Uh, in This is in the numbers when he <clears throat> married a black woman and Aaron and Miriam, you know, had a, had a big issue with it. And God came down, called a meeting and was, you know, says, hey, this is wrong. Moses is my man. He speaks for me. Leave him alone. He marry who he wants to do. This, to me, I actually have a sermon about it where it illustrates that racism is wrong, godly wrong. Amen, amen. And I think, by the way, an important indicator that, that racism is something that's, that's, uh, that's a, a, you know, a, a terrible history uh, and one that, that is, is long. Um, in, in the Jewish tradition, we have this idea that uh, that the the people in the Bible and the characters in the Bible or the the, the figures in the Bible um, are not perfect, and they show us sometimes um, positive things and sometimes negative things, and we learn from that those the situations. So um, when we have uh, Aaron and Miriam uh, sitting there, literally um, spouting racism, right? They say that that Kushite woman, which not only was an indicator. Of, uh, of 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 Moses's spouse being uh, black, but it apparently was was even a derogatory term at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it's a derogatory term today. Um, that's why I, I felt comfortable saying it out loud, and that's the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, my, but I, I do want to apologize if if that is uh, you know derogatory uh, or, or or heard heard in that way. Um, but. Um, we know about uh, it's a perfect example of, of this this racism and actually I don't know if you remember in that same story immediately Miriam is stricken with scales with, with, yeah. with Sarah. Right? and uh, and God is is basically saying we don't we don't do that mm -hmm. um, and and there's another beautiful thing there uh, which I'm not trying to imply uh, you know um, 
you know, too much in, in the sense of, of uh, uh, that there's a lot of important work and it's nuanced. Mm -hmm. But um, in the conversation about Whoopi Goldberg saying, this is about humanity and our humanity towards one another, um, you have Moses immediately saying, Adonai el Rafan Allah, God, please heal her. He's the one that was wronged and so was his spouse. And he's the one that's praying for compassion for mm -hmm. Miriam. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think mm -hmm. it's a reminder uh, that, um, that, well, that the ultimate project of all of this, a reminder of racism is that, uh, is that underneath it all is this need to see one another with love and with compassion. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let me ask you this. So y'all have a yeah. church on Friday, right? We have, yes. And, and, you know, it is uh, a term that we, that, that I do sometimes hear church, but we don't often use that term for ourselves. We usually say we'll have synagogue or shul as it is in the Yiddish. Uh, we'll, we'll meet at the temple um, and we meet on Friday, but it's a little different in the Jewish tradition. Uh, days start in the evening and they end the next evening. So we mm -hmm. start Friday night and then we go until the next night. All right. So I used to live in a neighborhood that was predominantly Jewish and I would see them walking and they have their hats and, the, you know, they, they're on their way. I, you know, my apologies, Rabbi. I'm a, uh, like, I'm a black man. I would come to you from the black church perspectives. I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, you know, I see them going to church. I, yeah. <laughs> you, you would ask me before, you know, to, to share if there were any language and anything like that. So that that's all. No, please, right, right. by all means. So we, yeah. we, you know, I see him going to church way, service and, and on, you know, on Friday and everything and, and the hats and everything. What is the what is the significance of the gangster brims I see my brothers, yeah. <laughs> my Jew, Jewish brothers wear to service? So there are, just like in the Christian community, there are different segments of Judaism. Um, the largest segment by far is the Reformed Jewish community, which is uh, the, the tradition of, of Temple Israel uh, and uh, and is the tradition that uh, many, many Jews who might wear a kippah, but but aren't wearing, you know, don't have the side locks or the payas and don't have uh, the, um, the the same same clothes as, as some of the people you're mentioning. Uh, you know, we, we, we kind of dress uh, in, in, in any way uh, that we might might be inspired to, to do so. Um, but there is a. Uh, um, uh, an Orthodox section of the Jewish community as well. There's conservative, there's different movements, but mm -hmm. uh, the Orthodox section, which uh, has lots of groups within it. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of Orthodox Jews that will uh, dress, uh, not, not dress that way uh, as well, but there is a, a, a small segment of the uh, ultra Orthodox Jewish community um, that has decided um, that they, uh, they the, the tradition as they know it at a certain time in history was uh, was deeply inspiring to them. And so they deliberately froze Judaism. Now, Judaism looks different every hundred years you roll back. If I was to show some of the things that we're doing today to Jews 500 years ago, mm -hmm. they would have no idea what we were doing. And mm -hmm. a thousand years before that, they would uh, we wouldn't totally recognize everything that they're doing. We would recognize the words, we would recognize the prayers, but some of the rituals would look different. It would look uh, separate. And so you have a group about 200 years ago that decided to freeze Judaism in that moment. Uh, and part of what they decided to freeze was not just the practice of rituals and so on and so forth, but the clothing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, the, the clothing that you'll see, maybe the, 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 fur, the furry hat, the strimal, um, mm -hmm. which I can't imagine how you wear that uh, when it's so hot out, but they will, they will wear that um, and, uh, and different, um, different um, you know, garb for uh, different kinds of suits. There, there's, there's a lot of nuances in terms of which particular group, even within that small segment of the Orthodox community, there are many segments. Um, and so each one has its own, you know, we wear our kippah this way, we wear our hat this way, that kind of thing. Um, but they, um, they have uh, taken on the, the garb mostly from Poland uh, mm -hmm. from about 200 years ago and held on to that. There's not a lot of um, deep um, textual history for that. Um, but they, um, they want to hold on to uh, the tradition and believe that that is the, the time that, that is right. It's not unlike, um, in some ways, um, the Amish community mm -hmm. that will uh, hold on to some of the practices from a certain era in time. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that they don't also engage with the world outside 
of the Amish community or outside of the ultra-Orthodox community, but they have a belief that the most meaningful life for them uh, is one that kind of harkens to and has uh, elements from, from that time. Does that answer your question? Those, That's those a very, really, yeah, it's, 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 it's very fascinating. You know, I just, like I said, we just want to have some fun here and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, examine our cultural uh, differences and, and oftentimes similarities. Okay. So uh, as we go out, let me just talk about this. So in my church, uh, we have heard our bishop preach about praise, praise to the Lord. And a lot of y'all that are listening to this or watching this, you know, in the black church, you know what we do, we praise the Lord, right? And so there are seven levels of praise, according to, uh, uh, you know, my pastor and others. And, uh, you know, I just want to, and he assigns um, the Hebrew words to what we do in our Pentecostal experience. And I just kind of want to, you know, review these with you really, really quick. And I know what your position is on some of these, because we talked about it on yesterday, but I still just want to kind of have fun and, and, yeah, yeah, uh, let's do it. and just see. All right. So the word yada, all right. When we extend our hands... This is as praise. You know, you're in the you're in church, and you know we're having praise and worship, and you extend your hands like this. That is called yada. Talk about that for a minute. Sure, sure. So, um, so we 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 shared yesterday that in the Jewish tradition we have we have uh, kind of a different, uh, you know, we 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 uh, we have different language for the kind of levels or or, or ways of of kind of connecting. Uh, in a in a more deeply spiritual uh, mode, um, and we share the language and, and this this same project of kind of making our way to a higher uh, existence, a, a more meaningful uh, existence. Uh, and yada um, in Hebrew uh, literally means to to know or knowledge. Uh, it, it's it's um, you know uh, somebody who knows. And so I'm wondering if. Uh, either it's a moment when you are opening up and, and truly knowing and, and uh, accepting uh, God into your heart or a moment when God and, and in the conjugation, it almost sounds like it might be referring to God knowing um, that God, that you are truly uh, seen and known by, by God in that moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how many times, saints, have you all you know, just bust out in a song happens to me while I'm doing my run or when, even when I first get up in the morning, I, I might say, you know, I, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This is Tahila, a spontaneous new song coming out of your heart, singing the melody. You might add some words to it, you know, when you're giving your praise. Tahila, talk about that there, Rabbi. So that's that's hope. That's 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 this 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 opening up and and knowing uh, that you live in a beautiful place. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, you know I, I love to sing. I I am um, I before I was gonna you know become a rabbi. I had a friend who said you know everyone knew you were gonna be a rabbi, but you. But I I didn't know that I was gonna be a rabbi. So I am um, I actually uh, pursued a career in jazz for a little bit, and uh, and I love playing guitar and I love playing music. And uh, all the time lately, I've been obsessed with the Beatles um, I, for maybe the past ten years. But I am I love the Beatles, and uh, and so I will find that there are moments all the time when I'm I'm singing, uh, and there's um, there's a spontaneity uh, that that comes with that form of prayer mm -hmm. that it's not prescribed. I'm just in a moment where I need to express, and actually Heschel. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, at its core, prayer is an expression of our deepest uh, needs, our deepest um, self. Uh, he said, prayer is the, the, um, the response to the inconceivable surprise of living. Mm -hmm. this, 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 this wonderment of being thrown into existence and saying, wow, what a spectacular world we are in. And uh, so often that voice uh, that comes from it is in song. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm thinking of the moment uh, at the Red Sea, right, where the Israelites are standing in front of an immovable object, and they see a miraculous occurrence, and they open up their mouths in song. In fact, the rabbis say, 
for the uh, the story that is in the five books of Moses, that's the very first moment that the community ever sings. Mm -hmm. It's a spontaneous mm -hmm. opening up of our hearts of singing. Uh, and so uh, when you talk about that uh, particular mode of, uh, of of prayer, that's what comes to my heart. <laughs> All right, you know, in the morning or when I just need to talk to the Lord, I get on my knees, I bow, just giving reverence to the Almighty. This is called Barak. Comes to your mind. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. While we're talking, I'm realizing, first of all, what we have, we have some Kabbalistic uh, ideas of spheres and so on and so forth, but they get very complicated very quickly, mostly because of illusion. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are literally charts that say like, this word means these 17 things. But, mm -hmm. um, but we also have in the Jewish tradition, uh, the, there, there's, a, there's a, a kind of general idea that there are 100 names of God. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea being not necessarily that God has a hundred names. I think I would, I would suggest there are many more than a hundred names for God. Um, but that these are all different ways of relating to God. And one of the things, uh, that, um, one of the, one of the names and one of the ways of relating to God is, um, is, uh, is, uh, either Shekhinah, which is the, the presence of God feeling like God is right there or Mahamakom, literally the place feeling like you're in a place where you are deeply connected to God. And when you talk about in the morning, just getting on your knees and just need, I need to be with God and I need this spiritual moment. Um, you're sparking in me uh, these names of God and specifically Shekhinah and Hamakom, this, this moment when you're by yourself, and you feel that presence. In fact, in, in Judaism, we, uh, we are a deeply heady community. Uh, and it is a big thing for us to say, there are moments sometimes that we can't explain. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's a moment we can't totally explain. We feel it. And once you start to try to kind of put your head into it, it, it disappears. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, that would be Shekhinah. Hamakom, those moments when you are just having a quiet, uh, quiet space with the divine. You know, it's interesting. You say Shekinah, we say Shekinah, Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. You know, is that's what we say. It's pretty interesting here. Hmm. All right, halal. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, they're related. I'm sure they're related. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, halal. Here's the thing, uh -huh. y'all. When we have that massive praise break, you know the one. Where the church is just going, people are taking laps around the around the sanctuary. That's halal praise right there. What is halal? Hmm. So halal literally means literally means praise, right? Uh, in fact, one of the great rabbis in the Jewish tradition is named Hillel. If you've ever gone to a college campus, you see Hillel is named after Rabbi Hillel, mm -hmm. um, and uh, his name literally means praise. Uh, that uh, that there's moments when uh, you're just wowed, uh, you know, uh, and it can be a private moment, right? Where, um, where uh, you're you're at the mountains and and uh, and you're just wow, and you you feel that praise. But I feel like um, you know, hallelujah uh, literally means to praise Yah, God. Mm -hmm. Yah is is a, is the is one of the words for God in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that. Um, that it's that moment when you're with a, a community and, and the song just just hits you right and you're just in that right moment that right mode where uh where um y y you feel something divine mm -hmm. there's there's that uh that praise moment so i i'm i guess i'm just reflecting but hallel uh literally means means praise literally mm -hmm. means that that moment when you're joined together as a community uh and offering uh offering up uh, thanks for, for this beautiful world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Toda. Toda. We said, you know, the praise leader says, everybody lift your hands unto the Lord. This is Toda, right? Toda. What do you say? So Toda um, uh, also sounds like uh, like the, the Hebrew word, uh, a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word Toda, uh, which literally means to thank. 
if you were to uh, to go to Israel and uh, and uh, and buy a, a sandwich, uh, you would you would uh, you know pay for the sandwich. I'm sure everyone by now is using the smartphones. You know, you'd pay with your smartphone. You'd take the sandwich and you'd say "tada," and you'd you'd walk over to the table and eat it. Um, that uh, that it means uh, thanks. And actually, um, the word "toda" uh, um, is ingrained in in Judaism in a very deep way. We all know the word Jews and Judaism. Uh, that word comes from uh, uh, Judah or Yehuda. The root of Yehuda, every name in Hebrew has a has a meaning, um, is toda, is thanks. And so I would say that it is kind of in the core of who we are as a Jewish community. Um, it's literally in our name to be a thankful people. Um, and uh, and so that moment uh, when you're offering that praise in church, uh, it, uh, it it reflects or I think is mirrored very much in the community, uh, in the Jewish community, uh, when we say modim anach nuach, mm. um, which is the same root as well. Um, we give thanks uh, for, uh, well, and then we list the things we're thankful for. You know, Toda is also um, when, okay, y'all, you know, when the choir marches in, and they have the procession, and you know, on on uh, on the different holidays, you know, choir marches in. That's a, a African American church tradition. That is also uh, uh, one of the descriptions, one of the definitions of toda, a procession or a line of uh, company, a Thanksgiving choir, and that's something. Zamar, okay, band members, look, I know y'all listening out here. Look, David Dottry, the Noble Brothers. All of y'all that listen to us regularly and are fantastic gospel musicians in the various large churches around the Black community, Zamar is to sing with instruments. That's what y'all are doing each and every Sunday. What do you say about that, Rabbi? So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in Psalm 150, it says, uh, you know, praise God. Uh, and then we have these translations in English, right, that say, Praise God with the flute and the harp and the, all these different things. Um, but scholars have looked at these words and said, it seems fairly clear that these words are instruments. Wow. We have no idea what instruments they are. <laughs> there, there's no clarity on what, what, what in the world is that, is that particular instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of all is encapsulated in, in you know, Zom, Z, there's a, it's a great book of Jewish music called Zamru Lo to 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 make music uh, for for God uh, and uh, and so uh, in the Jewish tradition I think this would be uh, our tradition also of of music uh, and uh, actually this coming Friday we have uh, a, a service that uh, each Friday is a, is a little bit different last week was our was our family service we we were outside and had kids running all over the place and doing dancing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this coming Friday is our musical service uh, when uh, we're going to focus a lot more on on the well the musical tradition. So um, I'll be playing guitar, and, and we have another member of our community who is a spectacular guitar player and a deep, deep soul uh, who will be offering music uh, with his guitar. Um, and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have we'll have different instrumentation um, that is very much uh, a part of that that uh, that same praise that I think you're, you're describing in, in, the, in the church. <laughs> All right. So do y'all, when you play your guitar and everything, I mean, y'all clap your hands and is, or does everybody just sitting quietly listening to the music? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, this is an instance where I think if you were to roll back, uh, you know, a few hundred years, you would, uh, you would find on a Friday night no instruments, and there's a mm -hmm. there's a historical reason for that uh, uh, in terms of Jewish practice. Um, but you would hear deep singing. You would hear this this just uh, you know this this chorus, not from up on the the uh, you know at the podium as it were, but but within the kahal, within the group, uh, everyone singing deeply. Um, and uh, somewhere about 200 years ago, there was a shift. Uh, and an attempt in the reform community uh, to bring in more instruments. Um, and, uh, and there was actually organ and there were choirs and uh, it was a deliberate attempt actually to mirror uh, a lot of the churches at the time uh, to modernize the, the, the music. And around that time, the Jewish community, and again, I'm speaking for the reform community, Orthodox is a little bit different. 
Mm -hmm. um, the reform community kind of started stepping back a little bit and didn't quite sing as much. Uh, we have someone at the front who kind of will sing. We uh, our uh, Cantor Cooper here at uh, at Temple Israel has a gorgeous voice. So I think some of us are just kind of going, well, I don't want to sing. I want to hear her sing. But mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's a you know a. a there was a slowly kind of stepping back again, 200 years ago, slowly stepping back of how much people would sing. And it became a little more, um, uh, a little more of a listening uh, moment to, to be in awe, to be overwhelmed, to be a full participant, but not to sing as much. And in the past, I'd say maybe 50 years uh, in the, in the reform community, um, there's been a very deliberate attempt to bring back a lot of that singing. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you were to show up here on Friday night, you would absolutely hear singing, um, but not quite in the way that we might have had it. And 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 I, for any of the members of my community who are listening, um, I, I want to say this, this is, you know, the rabbi saying, sing along. Uh, I know that you're singing, but don't be afraid to sing loudly. Let's sing together. That's what this is all about is us joining our voices together in song. Kendra Cooper and I are just there to help us find the right page. We mm -hmm. want to sing together. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of both in our tradition um, in that it's absolutely there uh, and we're, we're coming back to it too. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the last one. Number seven is Shabbat the Lord, to address in a loud tone. Now, you know, Rabbi, I got to let you know, you come to church with me. They, the volume is kind of loud there, my I'm friend. I'm there. I'm there. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's all the cracking, you know, and that's what the praise leader and the pastor are telling us, Shabbat the Lord, you know, uh, loud adoration with a shout, proclaim with a loud voice, you know. I need the Lord to hear me. There's a lot of us down here. You know, I need him to take care of his guy. I'm his guy out here in the world. I need him to hear me. Hallelujah. You know, and that's what it is. And and so what do you say? Shabbat? So we, you know, there's a there's an idea during the High Holy Days of uh of of these gates of heaven. Mm-hmm. And um, we absolutely have moments in the Jewish community where we are we are just singing and you know hear me God you know and, and not to invoke uh, you know this is the second time this week I've invoked uh, you know um, Tevi the Dairyman or um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof but you know you've seen Tevi saying God what are you doing you know uh, you know hear me I'm, I'm right here what why are you you know um, but the image and the 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 the, the concept that you're you're introducing uh, connects to me in terms of this this practice during the holy days, this idea that the gates of heaven are open, that there's a moment where God is kind of holding court a little bit, ready to hear what we uh, might have to say to God. But it's a little bit of a different practice for us in that it's a deeply uh, a deeply personal, deeply introspective practice. Um, the idea. Uh, is that we open our hearts to God, and it's in that moment that they're heard. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a quick story um, from uh, the, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of, of Hasidic Judaism, um, who used to go around to lots of different villages all over the place and tell these stories, um, and then stories came up around him. And the story goes like this, that there was a practice of blowing the ram's horn, the shofar, uh, on, on, uh, during the Holy Days, there still is, um, but that there was a contest of who would get to blow the shofar for uh, for the Baal Shem Tov, this great figure uh, in in uh, in the community, and everybody kind of came and and they they blew their shofar in a very loud and profound way, uh, or they had all the right things to say, and then there was one person who came up to blow the shofar and couldn't remember how to do it, ah. and kind of stopped tried a little bit and couldn't, couldn't do it. And in the middle of all of this pressure and this intensity, and he's standing in front of the Baal Shem Tov, he breaks down crying. And the Baal Shem Tov says, you're the one. Wow. Now, it seems a little strange because he didn't get the blasts right. He didn't get the notes right. He didn't say the things that you're supposed to say. But the point is that his heart was truly open in that moment. And that is the true source of prayer, at least for thy holy days. Mm -hmm. 
And so for the Jewish community, when we're trying to speak to God, there's a lot of personal interwork that happens as well. We open up the gates of heaven, but there's, or rather God opens up the gates of heaven, but there's a lot of work for us to do in opening up the gates of our hearts as well. Well, there you have it, y'all. <laughs> Rabbi Scott Fox giving us some uh, inspiration this morning. You know, that's a beautiful thing. We come together just to try to find some, some understanding. And, you know, that's what it is. We're all one race, monolithic in our humanity. We just have, you know, the different skin tones. The word says that we're made in his own image. And so, you know, when we get up there in heaven, we a friend of mine used to talk about what would heaven look like, right? And just like we we decided that heaven is probably divided into sections, right? And so we have the Methodist section over here <laughs> who's just kind of, oh, oh. then we have the Pentecostal section over here who's just cheering, cheering, cheering. We have the Jewish section over here. We have everybody has a set, but we're all in the same place. We are all one. We are all one. And that is the human race. And that's really what we believe here. We just like to talk about our different perspectives, you know, and I think that it's, I'm really appreciative of you taking the time to uh, come on to Coffee Conversations to examine this issue with, um, with Whoopi Goldberg and the, and address the dialogue that's happening in the, in the national, uh, you know, town square, if you will, uh, on this, on this whole thing. And, and it's really not coming, we're not coming from a space of hate. We're coming from a space of trying to understand. So I'm saying that to say, Rabbi, and you know, look, at the front lines of the movement is always the clergy. So you're right here with me. You know, they blocked us on Facebook today, you know, and isn't that something? Because <laughs> we all we try to do is come to understanding and examine the thing. We're not hating every, anybody. We're asking the tough questions and dialoguing and drinking our coffee. Amen, amen. <laughs> Any last words you want to say to the people? You know, I think that uh, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, at least, we have this idea that, uh, that we are constantly in conversation and constantly learning. And I'm really inspired by the, the image that you're talking about in terms of, of heaven having lots of different spaces, but that we're all in the same kind of same room, uh, same, same space. Um, that in Judaism, there's this idea of learning and dialogue and conversation. Um, and in the very earliest rabbinic text, it says when, when there's really meaningful conversation, when there's meaningful dialogue, there is a holy presence that is there as well. Uh, and so I want to, um, I want to, uh, offer thanks for, uh, for Greg to you for inviting me into this conversation, uh, and for us bringing what is for me, uh, a holy presence into uh, into this moment, uh, inviting uh, this shechina, this this divine, uh, this divine spark, this divine presence uh, in uh, in in the dialogue between the two of us, um, knowing that any time we have dialogue in the Jewish community, any time we have learning, it's not necessarily uh, always just for facts, although uh, those are critical, um, and not always just to gain information, although that is critical, but also to draw nearer to one another as well. And so, Greg, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you as well, uh, drawing near uh, and uh, and bringing uh, holy holiness into this moment. All right. I appreciate you so much. You know, y'all, if you want to get a hold of uh, Rabbi Scott Fox, uh, give him your email address. How do we contact, contact you? Please, please do. Please don't hesitate to reach out. It's just Rabbi Fox, R-A-B-B-I-F-O-X, just like the animal. Um, Rabbi Fox at T-I-L-B dot org, Temple Israel of Long Beach. I'm going to put that in the chat so it'll be memorialized. Rabbi Fox at, it again, T-I-L-B? T-I-L-B dot org. Org. There you have it. All right, y'all. There you go. We have it. Coffee conversations with Greg J. You know, look, they're trying to, they're trying to shut us, uh, shut our voice down. But we, you know, we're too strong for that. We do it. Do it. You can still uh, get it yeah. once we uh, go ahead in here and contest this with Facebook. Hey, isn't Mark Zuckerberg Jewish? 
He is. Yeah. Yeah. We'll call him. We'll call <laughs> So, you know, you're going to get it on our Facebook page, Coffee Conversations with Greg J. We're going to be on YouTube. We always repurpose the audio for uh, wherever you get your podcast, Breaker, you know, Google, iHeart, just wherever. Just put it in there, Coffee Conversations with Greg J. You know, Super Bowl weekend. I hope y'all cheering for the Rams. Be safe out there. Be safe, be safe, be safe. Live in peace and love one another, love one another. And before we give our last love one another, let me just share with you that next Tuesday, uh, prayerfully, we're going to examine the ports, the port of Long Beach. You know, they just had their state of Long Beach, uh, state of the port report. You know, it's a lot going on. They backed up out there, environmental situations and circumstances. So we're going to talk to some some of the high executives in the port to examine that. Whew, man. Rabbi Fox, you got me thinking today. <laughs> All right. Me too. You All got right. me thinking. Thank you very much, Greg. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Love one another, y'all. Peace and blessings.